Hey friends, welcome to the Taking Your Next Step podcast from Collegians for Christ. Through each episode, we will journey together focusing on becoming better followers of Jesus. If you are eager, like I am, to follow Jesus Christ, then take your next step now by joining us in today's episode. So the next question we want to ask is, what do I get out of this? You know, in life, we always want to know, hey, what do I get? If I'm going to sign up for this, what do I get? If I'm going to give you this, what do I get? If I donate my time, what, have I, what do I get? If I pay this amount of money, what do I get in return? And we're all wanting, most of us anyways, are wanting to maximize our return on our investment. Meaning we want to get the most out of what we put in. There's nothing wrong with that. That's wise That's wise business. I mean, we always want to make sure we're fair. We're giving a fair amount and getting a fair amount back. But we also want to make sure we're not getting gypped, right? We want to make sure we're, we're getting at least equality of what we're putting in. We're, we're getting a good return on our investment. So if I'm going to die to self, if I'm going to carry my cross around and I commit to following Jesus for this semester or for the rest of this year, What do I get out of it? Well, Jesus tells us in our passage here. He says in verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, this is Matthew 16, 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now here's where he starts to tell us what we get. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. I'm going to give you a few thoughts here on what we get, the benefits really to following Jesus. The first one is this, is we find life. We, you and I, find true life. Kind of a paradox here in verse 25, or whosoever will save his life will lose it. If I save it, I'm going to lose it. But if I lose my life, but notice what he says here, for my sake shall find it. If you will lose your life for me, meaning you put me first, you die to self, you deny yourself, then you will find life. That is the secret. That is the key to finding life. Put your life first and you'll lose it, but put Jesus first and you'll find life. I will believe we're all searching for that life. What do you mean that life? A life filled with purpose. It's so hard to go through a day a week and you feel purposeless. You feel you don't have any purpose. There's no meaning. There's no direction. There's there's no vision in your life. We're all searching for a life filled with purpose. We're all searching for happiness, right? I mean, I think the vast majority of us don't want to go through every day of our life mad, sad, and upset. I mean, that just brings you down. So we're looking for the happy life. We're looking for peace. I mean, if there's not something in life we're looking for, it is peace. With all the turmoil, with all the division, uh, with the war, and just everything constantly, there is such a lack of peace. We're searching for joy despite our circumstances, right? Where we can have that internal joy no matter what is going on in life. It's not dependent upon what people say, what people do, not dependent on what government's doing, not dependent on our paycheck and our bank account status. Joy is set because it comes from God. We're searching for a joy-filled life. We're searching for a life that is filled with satisfaction, that is filled with excitement. We're looking for a life of hope. I would say as I think about young people and uh, watching suicides and just things that go on, uh, our country in general, but then the younger generation is so hopeless. And so they're searching for hope. They're searching for meaning in life. And can I say this is the life that Jesus is talking about? You see, following Jesus is a decision, but it's more than that. Following Jesus is a lifestyle. And that lifestyle produces life in your life, in my life. You see, we have to uh, give our life. We have to lose our life for his sake. We have to be willing to give it over to him. And when we do that, that's when we truly find life. You see, we were created by God and for a purpose. You're created in his image. And as a result, he has a specific will for your life. You have certain talents and certain places you're going to be and all that kind of stuff. And if you will give your life over to him, you will fulfill your created purpose, which means you find life. 
And as we look at the life of Jesus, he lived a different kind of life than this world uh, promotes or pursues. And that's the life he's inviting us to live. So the benefits of following Jesus is we find life, we find purpose and fulfillment. We we discover what we're created for. Uh, and there's no greater feeling than living each day purpose-filled, knowing that you're living for what you were created for. And can I say this honestly helps tremendously to remove anxiety, distress, and depression in our lives as we experience these things because we're living the life that Jesus designed for us. When we live for ourselves, we can drive ourselves into the corner of anxiety, stress, and depression. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen even to people who are following Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when we live our own life, we're going to be more prone for those things because we're driving our life. We're going. He's second, third, and fourth, and we will put ourselves in situations that promote that and and breed that and grow that. But if we'll put ourselves second, or third, as we're saying, because we're going to live a sacrificial life, we're putting him first, then it will help drive away some of those issues like that. And then thirdly, keeping your soul. So you will find your life. You will find purpose and fulfillment, and you will keep your soul. Look what he said there in that passage. Some people exchange their soul. The most inner part of them, the most important part of themselves he says, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? I mean, if I gain the whole world, man, that seems awesome, right? To be the richest man or woman alive, to be able to have your name plastered on media and magazines as the richest person to be able to just buy and do whatever you want to do. I mean, that sounds great, right? But he says, what, it, what does it profit you? What's the benefit? What is the gain if you have the whole world? And in exchange, you lose your own soul. And he says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What can you exchange your soul for? You can't. He says this, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Wow. So there are literally some people that trade their soul. I have to ask you the question, are you trading your soul for what the world is trying to offer you, from what your career advancement may give you? Are you trading your soul for the sin that you're following, for the clicks that you're clicking and watching and what you're looking at? They literally trade their innermost being, their mind and heart for something that does not matter. Past life. We talked about earlier that you want to make sure you get a good exchange, right? A a good return on your investment. When you exchange your soul, you put the world first or you put self first. You're exchanging your soul and you're not getting a return on your investment. You're losing what is most precious. You actually lose your principal, and you get no return on it. And none of it matters. Verse 27 says God's going to come in the end, and he's going to reward every man according to how much money he has, how much success he has, how much uh, uh, possession she has. No, according to his or her works. That's all that matters. In our last couple of minutes here, let me share with you a story about Will. Will grew up in Chicago and surrendered his life to the Lord in high school. For his graduation gift, he talked to his parents, and many young people will maybe go to Daytona Beach, Florida. They'll, uh, they'll go to Cancun, Mexico. But for him, he wanted a trip where he could sail around the world. Now, this is the early 1900s, and so his parents got him the gift of a, of a ticket to be able to sail around the world. So he traveled through Europe, through the Middle East and Asia. And while he did that, guess what happened? He began to see many people groups without churches, without a gospel witness. And his heart became so burdened for all those who did not know Christ. And so when he returned back home, he told his family and he told his best friend that he wanted to give his life to reach these unreached peoples with the gospel. His best friend would say, man, you are throwing away your life, your talent, your ability, the opportunity that is afforded to you. You would be throwing away your life. And that night he wrote in his Bible two words, no reserves. Well, after that, Will went on to college. He would study at Yale University, but he went there with a surrendered heart. And as a freshman, it's reported that he started a Monday Bible study, Monday morning Bible study and prayer meeting that quickly grew to 150 students meeting each week. Now, by the time he graduated after those four years, uh, there were about 1,300 students estimated meeting in small groups due to his efforts. He also started what was called as the Yale Hope Mission House to help widows, orphans, and addicts. 
And while he went to school and he kept praying and seeking God, he received a great burden to plant a church among a, among a hard-to-reach people group in China, the Muslim Kanzu people. And so at graduation, he turned down many opportunities and one very lucrative career opportunity that was very tempting, but he turned it down to pursue this desire that God was leading him in. And he went home and he wrote two more words in his Bible, and it was these two words, no regrets. So Will planned to raise his own support. He was from a very wealthy family, and so he gave all that up. And he said, I'll raise my own support to go to China as a missionary. Now on his way, he stopped there in Cairo, Egypt to learn Arabic. But unfortunately, while he was there, he contracted spinal, spinal, sorry, spinal meningitis. And a few weeks later, he died at the age of 25 years old in a hospital room. Now, After they recovered his possessions and looked in his Bible, sometime in that hospital room, he wrote the final two words in his Bible, and they were this, no regrets. Now, some may say, what a wasted life. I mean, the opportunity he had, 25 years old, and it's gone. What a lost opportunity. But can I say to you that William Borden had a different perspective on life. He followed Jesus, put him first, and he gained. William Borden had a different perspective on life, and so did God. You see, his death became a rally cry for thousands of college students who would then surrender their lives to go to the mission field. Do you see what happened? There was one young man going to the mission field. Through his death, there were thousands of college students who went to the mission field. Why? Because he had a surrendered life and he carried around his cross daily. You see, he wrote no reserve, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. I encourage you to say no reserves. I will hold nothing back for Jesus. I will give him everything. No retreats. I will not turn back. I will follow him wherever he leads me. No regrets. As a result, uh, as no matter what the results are, I will not regret one moment of my life. And you may be thinking, well, that would never be me. I don't have the talent. I don't have the gifting that William Borden have to be able to do a Bible study like that. Uh, Can I say this? It's not about your ability, but about your surrender. It has nothing to do with the talents and the ability that you think you do or do not have. It is all about your surrender. And that is what God is looking for. So I want to challenge us as we go through this fall semester, as we go through the rest of this year, to put Jesus first in our lives. Not just as an add-on, not just as a squeeze-in or fit him in if we have time, not just when things are bad, but to truly follow him and to take him seriously this semester and through the end of the year. Thank you for taking the time to listen. If this podcast has been helpful to you, please share it with a friend or subscribe to stay up to date on the latest episodes. You can connect with Collegians for Christ online for more information and resources at cfccampusministry.com.